never the Russians don't believe in a gift that might hurt you. And not too long before Zenia died, she called me and said, I'm having a group of people over for a, a steak dinner, but yeah. I just realized I don't have steak knives. So I said, well, I'll send you mine. I had a box that I bought in England years yeah. ago, very nice, old, nice evening, yeah. cased. And uh, I sent them to her and she said, oh, but I can't use them unless, and she sent me back a little card, I can't use these unless you use this needle. She had a needle in the, in the, in the little uh, card and prick yourself, get five drops of blood, six, uh, six knives, get a drop of blood for each knife, otherwise it ends a beautiful relationship. He said, we cannot give anything that's, that's, that cuts or hurts unless you spill some blood for it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have animals at home in Mexico? Yes. Yeah. No, we had. But you see, but John never was part of that. He, wasn't. he didn't. He didn't. He didn't I, have uh, a pet animal that he loved. That. No, no, because he was never home. Uh, I mean, he left when he was 11 or so. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, yes, and, and where I was born in San Luis, John had a pony. Mm -hmm. that, I, that I know. I, didn't, I never saw it because I was born there, but my mother said that John loved his pony. Took care of him and brushed mm -hmm. him and very proud of his little pony. And she, one day he came running into the house and he was crying. My mother said, what happened? She said, Philip, his brother, up and kicked the pony. <laughs> up and kicked the pony. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that animal cruelty would upset your brother. Oh, yeah. And you in New York, he, that was another big argument we had. He um, said, um, I forgot how, uh, how he introduced the thing. In any event, he said, I've just acquired an Afghan hound. You know how big those oh, yes. things are? Yes. I said, John, an Afghan in the, your apartment? I mean, it's big, it's a big dog, and it sheds, it has long hair. You know, it's a beautiful thing, and, and it said, the, you know, it was a male or the mother was a prize winner at the, at the dog show. It was a beautiful animal. And he had him for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, but he saw he couldn't, he couldn't manage it. I mean, had to take him out to run every day. The big dog that needs exercise, and he eventually he had to get rid of it because he said, I just can't handle it. And he gave it to the woman that cleans his apartment, a black woman who loved the dog. Okay. And but, and she she always informed him how the dog was doing, and would show him okay. pictures, and, yeah. and she kept him. She was a I don't know if she worked only with him, but also in the lab and in. in uh, one of the hospitals in town. Mm -hmm. A very good, uh, hard-working black woman. She loved mm -hmm. the dog. What was the dog called? I don't remember. I, I only saw him twice, and every time I saw him, I said, John, you're out of your mind to have this thing in an apartment. Mm -hmm. Much too big. You get, get a small dog if you want, and one that doesn't shed so much. But he didn't get anything after that. Okay. It was a lovely a prize looking dog, beautiful. Interesting, he loved dogs. Yes. Yeah. Well, like Tonio, he's yeah. devoted to that one too. Something? Yeah. Yeah, but very vaguely. When was this? During the war, but I don't know just when. War time, the Second yeah. War. But that I, I remember that I used to dramatize it, but I didn't pay much attention. I thought it was fix, fiction. I mean, this. I mean, I, I think what I heard was um, uh, the spy couldn't pronounce Worcester and said something like Worcester. Worcester, yeah. And she called him that way. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah but yeah, so, because John was in Worcester or something, yeah. going to Worcester or something. Okay. But the, this was in Britain or in America? Not in America. In America. Yeah. Okay. Could be. I don't remember that he, because he still dramatize it quite a bit and make it. Okay. Make you feel like, oh okay. boy, and then yeah. what? Yeah. I'd have liked to have heard his oh. tell the story. Oh, so you'd, you'd be mesmerized because yeah. he had a gift for dramatizing. And yeah. He'd stop at the point where you wonder no more, and then what? Yeah. And he'd take a cigarette and smoke a little bit and then go on. I said, I'm your spinning tails. I just take your foot off the spinning wheel. 
You know, many people have mentioned the They That Walk In Darkness story. Oh, yeah. The Oaxaca thing. Mm. Yeah, that was very dramatic, too. Well, then she was very young in those days. It was just... I think he was adolescent, really. He was a teenager or a little over. Do you think that's the only one he published? As far as I know, yes. He didn't. He actually didn't like publishing much. He said so himself. He'd rather speak to people and be in contact, but to put it on paper and publish it and grab him. But he did that one. That one, for some reason. Maybe somebody insisted that he publish it. You know, yeah. you should. And we give it to me. I'll have it published or whatever. 1935. I think it was his first publication. I think in a way it's too bad that he didn't publish more because. But then you know, also when you look back on his life, he was so busy, always going someplace, or that to sit down and write takes it would take him off his his normal procedure of running to one place or another, yeah. one country, another country. Um, it's a different a different uh, routine. But he writes these long letters. I mean, to Sebastian, he wrote letters that are several pages long. Handwritten, too. Handwritten, typed, uh, closely typed. Yeah, but again, it was like a personal communication. Yes, of course. It wasn't for, every, mm. for the general reader. No. I mean, not, not just medical mm. books, but mm. um, philosophy, art. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, philosophy is... It's Cause he said, you used to say, uh, medicine is not a science, it's an art. John said. It's, he, he thought very deeply about the basis of medicine. Yes. I mean, that's, that's quite clear. Putting medicine on a new philosophical basis. That's I right. Think is, is, I mean, that's a, a real achievement. That you, you, you are a doctor in psychiatry? No. No? No, no. History. History? PhD, yeah. I mean, that was one of his favorite readings. Okay. So it's this sort of Thomistic philosophy, I yes. think, which then becomes a basis for a new critical philosophy of medicine, medicine. which is person-oriented yes. and based on human love, yes. from divine to the human, human. Yes, right. um, mystery of the incarnation and so on. But it was a very powerful critique of conventional, say, conventional psychiatry. Which yes. was becoming more and more mechanistic and yeah, these, yeah. Um, electroshock treatment. And, um, yeah, the, 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 the stuff they shoot in you. Yeah. What is it? Insulin or whatever yeah. they do. Absolutely. He, did he speak about this? He was against that. I know he, yeah. he fought it at the, the insane asylum in New York, Long Island. I forgot what the name of the place was, where he felt they were doing these people terrible damage with the. Yeah shocks and the injections and yeah. stuff, so that's not the way to deal with it. I mean, that knocks them out and it, it may pacify them, it almost kills them, yeah. but that's not, that's not curing them, not, yeah. not helping them to regain their, their normal state. He hated all that stuff. I think he wanted to keep the patient out of the... Yeah, not only that, but he'd say, you know, when you go into a doctor's office, you have problems with either your heart or your lungs yeah. or your liver. It isn't a diseased liver, it's a person going there with a diseased liver. It's not a liver that walks in, a diseased liver. Very good. It's a human being, he says, a human being with a diseased liver, but not a liver by itself. You have to treat it with the whole person. Mm. Not be allowed out to just disappear and mm. fade into nothing. Although there must be other people that think, are beginning to think the same way. That Yes, but your brother was very sophisticated. Yes, and only had been probably one of the pioneers in that, that field. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's issues of consent, patient-doctor relations and so on. It's now so important that he really pioneered that. Oh, yes. That's extraordinary. Uh, and, this, yeah. and she'd say, do you think I'm going to like this? she said, well, try it. I can't tell you if you're going to like it. He sees the new dish that he hadn't tasted before. Do you think I'm going to like this? So for him, he had to really learn about Mexican oh, culture. Oh, yes. And he liked it. Yeah. I, I, he, we used to put quantities of hot peppers on everything we ate. And at first, he, he, he was 
kind of rough on him, but then he got to like it, and he was just going along with the crowd. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he obviously felt, I mean, he felt very committed to Mexico then. I mean, did he view Mexico as his homeland then? Well, he never gave up his citizenship. He always remained an Amer- American citizen. But he never, when, when he retired from business, he told my mother, I'd like to go back to the United States and then my years where I was born. She took a very dim view of the whole thing because she, she didn't like this country. I mean, for living. She liked to visit, mm-hmm. but not to live. And um, they started looking for a place in California, went across the whole country to New York, mm-hmm. looked in New York, New York State. Yeah. And um, there was some, a couple of places that my father sort of liked and almost was ready to... And, uh, my mother said I was praying every night that we wouldn't buy it, that we wouldn't stay there. I didn't want to disappoint him or, or make him sad about it, but I didn't want to. And my wish came true when he said, no, let's go back. And then they bought a place in Mexico City. But uh, she said uh, she never learned how to cook. So to start at Harry, she learned to cook and to do all the house chores herself, which she never did and laundry and everything, everything here people are all have to do their own work. Unless you're very wealthy and can afford help, and even then it's hard to get. I mean, the, what it costs you to have a maid here is incredible, and all the insurance you have to have on them, and you have to pay their social security, and it's a, a major production. Whereas in Mexico we had, the cook had been with us 60 some years. All of two of them, the housemaid that made the beds and cleaned the rooms, they were both set in the 60-year service. Yep, because your parents were very long-lived. Yeah, because they also outlived my parents, but we kept them. I mean, my father left money for, them to, for the rest of their lives. But they cooked, um, cutting her toenails, infected the foot or something, she got septicemia or something that amputated her leg. And the doctor who did the surgery told my brother that judging from her bones and whatever else, she was over a hundred years old. It was funny because the other maid, they they both shared the maid's quarters in the back of the house, a little house of their own. And um, the other one that wasn't operated on, after they buried the cook, she asked my brother where that they put the leg in the coffin, the leg they cut off. I said, why? Oh, because she can't, she can't walk around heaven with one foot, only one leg. She should be put in the casket, that other leg, so she can walk. Hmm. And then I said, yes, of course, it was there. I mean, hmm. it's been a long time. It'd been, they threw it away when it was cut off, I guess. Hmm. Hmm. But with, she said, without that leg, she's going to, be roaming in purgatory forever, never getting to heaven. Did your mother re- always sort of tell tell you what you were all doing? Did, you know, when you sort of wrote, did she sort of relay news? Oh yeah, um, as much as she could. And she ran the show. She was instinctively yeah. an organizer, and uh, not not um, I wouldn't say heavy-handed, but she wanted to make sure that everything was going the way she wanted. And in the upper story, she had a little intercom with the rest of the house. She could call the maids on the phone. And she'd give orders like a general. And they all loved it because it was with us over 60 years. And the nice part was, I mean, when you have maids that have been, they're part of the family, really. And she'd call the cook and say, look, instead of four, they're going to be eight for dinner. No problem. I mean, no, I can't do it or you should have told me nothing. No, okay. Yeah. They were um, standing in line to get tickets for some show or other. And um, either Jaime was ahead or just behind John. And John saw him and then Jaime smiled. And John noticed he, his teeth needed work. And he told he just said, it was a complete stranger. I told him, you have to have your teeth fixed. And Jaime at that time was hand to mouth. He didn't have any money at all. And so he, John said, I'll, I can have them fixed for you, I'll take, I'll take the bills. And he fixed his teeth, and that was the beginning. Strange. 
He said, I saw this young man and I had him and he turned back and smiled. And his teeth needed a lot of work. So I started the conversation. I got him to the dentist. And I'm not sure whether he was at the, I think he was at the memorial, but he couldn't go to St. Thomas. He sent his son. But I don't remember him at all. I think after the, the memorial, they had a reception at, at uh, Rosenbaum's home. And um, I don't remember him at all. I remember Jean, whoever her name was, his wife. Jean, Jean Rosenbaum. Vaguely, because she just, of course, mm. expressed her condolence, and that's it. True, he loved the French. Yeah. But not the Germans. No. Well, some just for one last time, as I told him, yeah, I told you before, we had, uh, we'd have discussions about uh, Germany and France and Germans and French. And I told him, John, I can't help my feeling to the German. It's different from yours, but you have to realize I started kindergarten with him. I was five years old, went through grammar school, went through high school, all in German. And I have wonderful memories of the school and of the Germans. I had wonderful teachers. So no matter how I dislike what they're doing, I can't erase what they, what they left in me. Because he was trying to convince me that they were that they were not to be trusted, that they could be, he used to say they, they, they'd be crying for the father, and all that, all of a sudden turn around and kill somebody. He wasn't like, I mean, he, this was a criticism which developed as a result of Nazism. I mean, it doesn't strike me as before then. So he went to Germany to study. Hmm? You're, I mean, John went to Germany to study. No, I didn't go to Germany. No, but John did. John did, yes. Okay. He was in Freiburg, wasn't he? Yeah, simply there. Freiburg. No, my German was all the Auslandschulen, yeah. the schools of the German. But of course, they they were promoting Germany. Yeah. Although I think it was, they called them out out of the country schools. Yeah. But they sent all all their teachers came directly from Germany. Yeah. And uh, they infused us with German yeah. culture and also. Uh, um, I woke at a love for German things. Mm. I mean, I'd recited German poetry, and I loved their music, and I loved everything. Absolutely. I mean, it's, and they promoted it in school. Yeah. And then when the war came, all of the people, I'm sure, in the German school were pro-Nazi. As a matter of fact, when I uh, applied for a commission in the Navy, because I would be drafted otherwise just as a GI, uh, and somebody said, why don't you apply for with your knowledge of language and stuff? They might be able to use you in some other form than just a foot soldier. Yeah. So I did, and I had to write down where I went to school and this and that. Where's your grammar school? German school. Where did you do your high school? German school. Where were you born? Mexico. So I was out. <laughs> Nothing is what they wanted to hear to give me a commission as an officer in wartime. Yeah. So they said, well, we'll check and all this. And they sent people to Mexico to check me out, to see what connections I had or what, what they could hold against me. And they went to the German school uh, to look up records and stuff. And when I was a student, they had an enormous picture of Bismarck in the, in the later in the room where the teachers, like a, where they go to rest in between classes, a life-size portrait of him framed on the wall. When they went, it was Hitler. And my picture, I was the yeah. captain of my class with a red, white, and black flag across oh, me, next to Hitler. And that threw them. I said, yeah, but remember, I, I, Hitler wasn't even, probably wasn't even born when I was doing this. Yeah. It was the Germany of Bismarck. And then after six months, they finally took me. They felt that I was a, not a threat to them. Well, closed before yeah. nobody even considered. Yeah. I mean, he never saw them, everything come to fruition, but at least he he indicated what could be done, what what possibilities there mm. were. I mean, obviously, one you know, it would be interesting what he would have made of this counterculture when as it erupted. But uh, you don't know. Don't know. Don't know. And we don't know what will happen after we check out. I mean, no, no, no. but. Um, best of his ability, yeah. and uh, if he promised you something, he'd kill himself, but it would be there when where, where he promised it. Mm. Reliable. Mm. You know, and I know he, 
weekends he didn't like to uh, get up too early. But if I said, will you take me to the airport or something, it would be seven in the morning. Yeah, I'll be there. He was there, exactly. I didn't have to worry, is he coming, is he not coming? Whatever he said he'd do, he would do. But the last time I saw him, he really looked exhausted, he looked transparent. And I said, are you feeling well? He said, yes, I'm just tired. Deeply, sir. Hmm? Deeply. Yes. And he looked at him, he, he said, why don't you come with me to St. Thomas and stuff? I said, no, I can't. He said, well, I have to get out of here, but I'm exhausted. And then he said, you know, you were in Riverdale. You've been to Riverdale. Yes, you've seen No, I haven't been to Riverdale. Oh, no? I've just been past it on the Hudson oh, Line. I've oh. not been to the, oh, to I the house. Oh, I see. Well, it was a good, good drive from, yeah. from New York. And to go to his office on 70-something, 72nd of 4th Street, from there, it's a long drive. And it was too much for him, I mean, darting back and forth. Uh, of course. I mean, there was the... But before Riverdale, he had the um, he had he was going up to Albert Einstein That's right. every day. That's right. I said that was a big haul too. So that and, and I could never somehow get him to think or could do something where it would all be simpler. Get a, get a place where it's close to where you work, whatever, make life simpler for you. And, uh, would have been difficult. Because he needed to be in downtown Manhattan, yes. and Albert Einstein needed yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. Now, at Riverdale, he could go, it was like a, a point in a triangle. Which it could be, yes, but it, it, yeah. it made sense. And then so, he had the car. There was a lot of driving, and, and uh, he was a very bad driver. I hear what? I died. Many times I thought, I'm not going to ride with you, make me too nervous goes down the wrong street. I mean, the one-way street, he goes the wrong way. And all the cars honking at him. He wouldn't, wouldn't phase him at all. Keep on going until he got away. Place where he could get out. I used to go visit him in the, in the hospital up in the Bronx. And I said, even here, John, you picked the farthest hospital for me. Why didn't you go to a hospital to make it easier for me to get to? I have to, after work, I have to take a subway for 45 minutes to come check on you. When you could have been right next door and be so much simpler. I said, everything you do is complicated. But he liked Albert Einstein. Oh, yeah. Well, he was very fond of Milton Rosenbaum and Jean. And, uh, and he had students that he liked that were very receptive, like Bauer. As a matter of fact, say, when he uh, got into the swimming pool, there were younger members of the club in the pool. He uh, uh, challenged them to a race to race the pool. And he almost always won. Incredible with the kids, not kids, but people in their 20s, 30s. I remember one, one of the young people said, you know, your brother's like a walrus. <laughs> everything and he liked the club too because it had a very good restaurant and he after the swimming or the squash or whatever he gets up all dressed up and go upstairs to a very okay. good restaurant very well served and of course they never packed because it was just for members nobody could go except the members of the club and their guests I often had dinner with him. I think he said, when he threw swimming at six, come and meet me with that dinner. And then he had a friend, I didn't say friend, but uh, one of the waiters at the club became friendly with John. He used to sneak um, pumpkin pies out for him at Thanksgiving or Christmas and give them to John. A pumpkin and a, 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 a mincemeat pie. He likes good food, there's no question. He knew good food. Could he cook? Well, that I don't know, because I told you the story about the crowd. He had me come up to his apartment to share with him. 
all these little little uh, chops put up like a crown with a little yeah. tissue paper on each one. And then when I went in the kitchen for something, all I had left him, all you have to do was put it in the oven. But he told me he had prepared it. So what cooking he did, I don't know. I have, his freezer was had a, I'm not exactly, maybe 10 or 15 quarts of ice cream. Apparently he loved ice cream. But we, I saw him maybe three or four times at a meal in his apartment. Usually we met in some bistro or some yeah. restaurant. Yeah. Or he came to you. Um, yeah, or he came to me. Because as I said, when he was in the 70s, I was in the 80s. And this, you know, New York blocks are very short. And sometimes he even walk across Central Park and come to my place. Yeah. And, uh, as I say, he was that wonderful uh, dichotomy of a, almost a ascetic saint, and then a bon vivant, good mom, enjoy good food, good wine, good company, and then you go to a retreat and be a, lead a saintly life of practically no food, meditation, prayer. And it wasn't phony, I mean, it, it wasn't he was pretending, he did pray and meditated hard, you know. I, when I go to church, I'm not, I close my head and pretend I'm, I'm not meditating at all. See that he was transposed. Oh, yeah. Other. And those retreats he'd go to in the winter sometimes, in Canada and I think Vermont too, somewhere I, in the north. I know he went to a place called saint benoit du lac that, That's in uh, Canada. In Canada, yeah. yeah. And then he went to others too, I don't remember which. Did he go to Kentucky? Did he go to Gethsemane in Kentucky? I don't think so. And, I, and John knew him or something. He got here, Mr. Allen, rehearsing for the next He Allen gave a, uh, organ concerts in this chapel. And uh, John would go listen to and rehearse the program for the next concert. And he loved it. He loved these colored stained glass. All the, uh, the feeling of the chapel. Yes. He loved it. Oh, that is interesting. Because I, I mean, I, I, I just mentioned it. As, but only on the basis that I s presume, but I didn't realize that. He yeah, I, mean, no, I remember the name Mr. Allen was one of his. Okay. And uh, he gave concerts, I think, once a week for the Palo Alto community. And the chapel would be full of people. And he was a good organ, a very gifted organist. Do you know they still give concerts for the community? They do? Yeah. You see, same yeah. thing. Yeah, it's the you through. Yeah. But John said he used to love to go hear Alan rehearsing for the, his program. But did he do music? I mean, did your brother participate in anything musical at the university? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. As far as I know, never studied yeah. music. Like I told you, the flamenco went almost uh, ridiculously in love with flamenco music. And want to know who the flamenco, in my mind, who the great flamenco people were. He went to Paris and bought a beautiful, regular, like an uh, anthology of flamenco songs. Mm -hmm. uh, produced by Patel, remember Patel, all the people. This record was done by them. All the great flamencos of the time, mm -hmm. John Julius number. And John Mordecai. Oh. And he had a big record collection. He? Yeah. Oh, yes. No one was. As a matter of fact, I got to add it for the world. So, yeah. I think he's all over there. All right. What do you know about Vladimir? Very little. I remember the name of Vladimir. Okay. I mean, I know very little as well. But there's yeah. Vladimir Slavitsky, That's right. who was in, who was, his parents were Russian emigres. I think the father had died young, and again he was having a very disturbed, very disrupted very time, dropping in and out of school. school and right. I think the brother wanted him to study properly, which Vladimir wouldn't do. That's right. He was a problem child. He was always fighting going to school, and just was a rebellious, disturbed really. Yeah. He had, his family had a hard mm. time mm. with him. Leaving Russia and being in the States, yeah. The French were not too friendly with the Russians. 
What did you say about it? Did you say anything or is it something you just sent? A what? A UNESCO. Um, when I went two times I visited John in Paris, the UNESCO, and I remember walking into his office and I could see the sadness on his face. I, I don't belong to you. Take me out of here. All the bureaucratic papers and filling out forms and stuff wrong for him. I mean, I, th I, I think I know why, because those of people that came from a modest uh, family in Mexico, and so if, when he got to be important, and he was trying to like be the lord of all, and everybody had to bow down to him. He got sort of a complex of being, I'm the head of all this, and John couldn't take those things. I mean, he, he was very good his grave. And John was so infinitely superior to the Torres of Benton and mental faculties and everything else. I mean, no comparison. Torres of I think, was a good man and everything else. But, but he was not certain he could come to John's needs, mm -hmm. intellectually or background or anything. He was a nice um, half breed. Uh, come up from a very modest... What, half Indian, half yeah. Spanish? Yeah. Yeah. Modest background. And you saw the pictures of me that were modest where John yeah. came from. In some mental institute in New York, he right. said, come with me, I want to show you what I got a topic patient of mine. And I went with him, and there was this boy room in the corner, crouched, with his arms in this position. And John said, he tried to move his arm. Like, I, you could you couldn't move it. And he just would sit there all day on night like that. And John would talk to him for a while over here. And I said, do you think you're getting in the movie? I don't see if he reacts. He says, you don't see it, but I know that he's listening to me. Hmm? He's not reacting. It's all going in there. After a few months, he asked me to go back again. And the boy was standing up only. And uh, not well yet, but he wasn't in the catatonic state anymore. He was crouched dead, sitting like this. And I said, Did you use drugs or anything? He said, No, no. Just talking to him. Incredible, isn't it? No. Christian of Paintings in New York. John said, Will you accompany me? To, I want you to see some paintings that I like. And it was a new young artist. And uh, he went and I said, I, I don't like them. I don't know if they were anything, John. Oh, but I want to buy one. I said, well, If you want to buy it, but it's not, he's not an artist. He paints, he smears he's, he's paint on the canvas. I said, That's not being an artist. And John was very disappointed because he was. Hoping I would say yes, buy it. Okay. But I saved him. I mean, the painting was worth two or three hundred dollars. Yeah. He's just throwing it away. It's not worth anything. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. It wasn't Jackson Pollock or. Huh? It wasn't the Jackson Pollock exhibition. No, 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 no. Just, it was just nothing. It was just a little bit of everything smeared yeah. together.